alternate way of looking at it. That's right. That's right. So if you recall, and for those of you maybe that missed last week's show, we talked about once we pitch the yeast, the, yeast, the, the first phase that they go through is called the lag phase. You know, what that means is that you really can't, when, when you just sit there and you stare at your vessel, whether that's a carboy or a bucket or a trash can or a 3,000-gallon uh, conical fermenter, you, you look at it and you can't tell that anything's going on. Uh, that's because the yeast haven't got actively into assimilating the sugar into ethanol. Um, they're actually trying to get ready for the job, and so they're taking on some of the macronutrients in the uh, yeast. They're getting associated with the uh, gravity and the pH, and so it takes them a while before they get completely settled, so to speak, where they feel like, okay, I'm, I'm now ready. I don't need to do anything more to get ready. Now we can go to work, and then they start metabolizing the honey sugars into ethanol and into CO2. So when you first pitch your yeast, you're not going to see anything going on. This is the lag phase, and that's to be expected. One of the things that you might just keep in mind all too often on social media, uh, every day people get on and say, I pitched my yeast X amount of hours ago or days and uh, Hopefully this won't happen to any of you, but some people even get on uh, 10, 10 days, two weeks, three weeks later and said still nothing is going on. Folks, that's really not a good place to find yourself at. Um, also, you need to will, define will, what mean what going nothing going on means because I have had people complain that their airlock isn't doing anything and that's what they're looking for, <laughs> and it just yeah. was a leaky airlock. So, yeah. you know, that's right. look yeah. at it. Do you see Thank bubbles? You. Do you see foam? That's the type of thing you're looking for. And yeah, conversely, that's you right. have people that say, look, it's bubbling, so it must still be fermenting. It's like, have you measured it? Because just right. bubbles mean air of some kind, some kind of gas, and it just could be your, your yeah, and you never on you. You know, you just You really know. never know, because I had a strawberry wine that finished in a week, and the specific gravity didn't change after that first week, mm -hmm. and it bubbled for three months after that, with no change in specific gravity. So, bubbling does not mean it's actually doing anything. It just means it's bubbling. You had gassy strawberries. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, and, and sorry, Ryan, carry on. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That, that's a great point, you guys. You you have to buy a hydrometer and learn how to read it. You, if you if you consider yourself at all uh, one that's going to get into making me, you really have to have a hydrometer. That's no less important than having a bucket to put your yeah. to put your must in. You have to have that. Otherwise, you're flying blind and you have no idea what's going on. Now, up until just recently when people started using these bulletproof approaches, we used to measure our gravity and we would feed our yeast the nitrogen that they would require at different, at different gravity readings. But yep. we've made it even easier now where you don't even have to have a hydrometer to know when to feed your yeast, but you very definitely have to know what your starting gravity is. You'll need to know what your final gravity is to be able to calculate what your alcohol percentage is, mm -hmm. your ABV, and then, of course, um, any honey that's left behind once the fermentation is over, either from the yeast reaching their tolerance level, and in, in, I like to call it their, their tapping out, um, or you've stabilized your meat at some point and you've ceased the fermentation, you've arrested it so they can't, they cannot ferment, ferment any longer, then at that point, you, you may be totally dry, which means you don't have any residual sugar left in your mead, and it'll taste extremely dry, or then depending on how much leftover sugar, or we call it residual sugar, you might even see that as, as just RS in capital letters, and when you're reading linear material, that stands for residual sugar. And that then will determine how sweet your meat is. Well, this brings up several different points, so I'm going to backtrack for a second. Once we, so we talked about um, the lag phase. If, in my opinion, 
one of the things that is an indication that you're not using enough yeast is if you're having a really long lag phase. I generally, uh, most of the time anymore, I'll put together and pitch my yeast right before I go to bed. And I, I just don't think even in the last two years I've ever not had something going full blast in the morning when I woke up and got ready to go to work. And so it'll vary some depending on your different uh, parameters and whatnot. Um, but generally I think that you should see your lag phase over, meaning now when you look into your must, you're, you're either seeing very small, tiny bubbles that are rising up to the top, and that's really easy to see early on before they're right. They're, in other words, when they first start, they're very small, and they'll rise to the top, and if you're looking over the top, the meniscus, the film on the top of your must, and you're looking so that you, the light can reflect off of that, you'll often see what I call little pricks, and what, what I mean is the <laughs> bubble has surface to the top and it's pick, it's pricked like with a pin it pricks the top of that meniscus and you can just see the you can see the gas escape and it just looks like it's I don't like know champagne. I hope you can understand it, what I'm trying it, it to it looks a lot like champagne going off right although even much much smaller than that and yeah. you can generally see that with a flashlight even much easier than you can with your naked eye that's generally the first thing that you'll see and then a little while after that it starts to get a little more aggressive and then eventually you'll be able if you get down close to it and listen you'll be able to hear the the the, the hissing of the bubbles breaking the surface and then eventually uh so that's when they first start to get active that's when we want to feed our yeast their first breakfast if you will <laughs> oh yeah okay now you got me you had to kick off the hobbits didn't you Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so um, you want to feed them after you see that they've gone out of the leg phase and started into the growth phase. Now, the reason why we don't want to feed before that is if you've got other uh, different wild yeast strains in there or um, microorganisms, the bad guys as I like to call them, we don't want to give those any advantage at all. And so we've already given our yeast a huge advantage when we rehydrated. We gave them all of the macronutrients that they need for the whole journey. We gave that to them at birth, so to speak. Um, and they now have food inside them, and they can start eating the sugar. And so we really don't need to feed them a big, solid, hearty breakfast of oatmeal and eggs and toast and orange juice and all of that until they're like real close to going out and getting started working. And so we wait to feed them the first dose of food until after we see proof that the lag phase is over. And so by doing that, we're not we're not giving the bad guys food to eat for free um, while the yeast weren't necessarily in that mode of, of uh, wanting to feed in that regard. So... We feed them the first dose. Now, the reason that we don't feed everything up front, like like people used to when they first started feeding, is that when we feed our yeast, that creates a lot of energy. It, it induces uh, replication. In other words, they start to mass produce at a much higher rate than without the food. If we were to give them all the food up front, um, especially if we use DAP, and we'll talk about DAP in a couple minutes, but we, when any time that the yeast are actively metabolizing the sugar to make al alcohol, there's a temperature spike that occurs during that process. They're actually creating energy, uh, much like if you go out and it's cold in the morning and you just started jogging in, in you know, just a few minutes' time. You're, you're pulling down the zipper on your jacket and maybe you had a, a, a head covering or something. You're, you're getting hot. You're, you're heating up. Well, the yeast do the same thing when they go to work, and that increases the temperature of your, your must. And as hopefully you know by now, that temperature spikes. If you raise the temperature too much, it creates a lot of off flavors and byproducts that we used to have to age out. 
over time in the aging process. So rather than giving them all the food up front and seeing these huge temperature spikes, if we feed them over a period of time, a little bit at a time, and, and just for an example, if we feed them 25% of their food, we're only going to see t- one. We're only going to see one quarter of the temperature spike in our must than we would have seen if we fed them 100% of the food at the same time. So, we're with with the Tasna. You start feeding. I think they say at pitch. Um, I'm here to tell you that, in my opinion, if you wait until after the lag phase is over and then start, I think that's going to serve your purpose even better. But if that's too confusing, you can certainly just feed your first dosage of food right when you pitch your yeast. But in any case, then once you feed the first dosage, you now have three more dosages that you're going to feed your guys. Uh, and so you feed them on a scale, on a on a schedule at every 24 hours. So for me and how I generally do my stuff, um, I pitch right before I go to bed. I wake up in the morning. It's time to feed them just like I feed myself. So I get up in the morning. I degas them a lot. I have a lee stir that I attach to my drill. And I'm actually stirring very vigorously with intention to create a big vortex in my bucket or my trash can and that brings up a point, you guys. If you ferment in a bucket or an open-top vessel rather than in a small neck-down carboy or a glass uh, gallon jug or something, you have. An, I think it's much easier to ferment in these open-top vessels for several reasons. Um, you won't, unless you're just stupid and you're filling up your bucket too full, you're not going to have foam overs that that are going to go blasting through your airlock. In fact, I don't even use an airlock until I'm at least halfway done with my fermentation. I have open buckets. Uh, Generally, I make stuff in 12-gallon trash cans. And all I do in the beginning is put uh, a clean dish towel over the top to keep stuff from falling in from the top. As you know, yeast can float around and then they drop. So that's how... uh, foreign yeast could get into my must and I generally don't have uh, problems with flies although anybody that makes enough meat will know that on occasion we get some fruit flies but if I have my dish towel over the top of my bucket nothing can get in there but the good thing is it's still exposed to a lot of oxygen and if you recall our our message last week we spoke uh, pretty extensively of why oxygen is so important in the mead making process. Well, now that they've gone to work, they're also making CO2, and this gas will, will get held up in suspension in the must. Many of you have heard, and probably as many also have had the experience where you pour in your food. <laughs> and um, It's like a high school a, science a, experiment. It's like those volcanoes we that, made in high That's right. You get a, you get a huge foam over yeah. Now, I'm here to tell you how you can feed your mead without getting this foam over. The first thing that you need to do is you need to degas. However you do that, I like a lee stir that attaches to a battery-operated drill, and I, I squeeze that as hard as I can. And by design, I'm trying to spin that up at high volumes, and I actually will manipulate my lee stir by moving the handle at different angles into the must, and I'm trying to create a vol- a, a vortex, if you will, a, a hurricane that's sucking air down inside the mud. And at the same time now, I'm splashing that around in a way that it's causing all the foam to foam up to the top, and that's releasing all the gas that was in suspension from the yeast working overnight. So, we know from last week's message that we want to aerate our yeast, and we want to do that for at least till the first Third sugar break, again, meaning you've, you've consumed a third of your sugar. Um, and so we, we'd want to do that twice a day, even on days that we're not feeding. But we, we want, so if you get up in the morning or whatever you're going to feed your yeast, degas it first. Try to stir it enough that it's not actively degassing anymore. You're not seeing these big, huge uh, 
foam, you know, foam rising up off the top. You can stir it long enough that you don't see any more 